Hello everyone, welcome again. So today's lesson will be on the industrial chemistry option and in particular we'll be looking at the uses of sulfuric acid and in today's lesson we'll be talking about the properties and reactions of sulfuric acid. So what, how does sulfuric acid behave in a chemical system and what are its basic properties in terms of um, things like density and its reactivity and things of that nature. So basic properties, uh, and by basic I mean fundamental properties, not you know, acid-based properties. So its fundamental properties are that sulfuric, is, uh, sulfuric acid is colorless and oily, so it has a, very, it has a high viscosity um, when it's not dissolved in water. So we're talking about neat sulfuric acid or pure sulfuric acid, and it has a density of about 1.8 grams per centimeter cubed. So it's almost twice as dense as water, because water is about one gram per centimeter cubed. So it's almost twice as dense as uh, the water molecule. So you can see that it's quite a dense and viscous liquid. Its melting point is fairly low, it's, uh, or fairly high actually, it's 10 degrees Celsius. And its boiling point is very high, much higher than water, 337 degrees Celsius. Now, sulfuric acid is generally always found in concentrated form. Um, until we need to dissolve it, uh, simply for storage reasons. If you have a very concentrated amount of sulfuric acid, you don't need as much volume to store it, you just dilute it later. Similar to how cordial works, I suppose. You don't have to have you know, 10 litre bottles of cordial if you're just going to dilute it anyway. So sulfuric acid is available at concentrations as high as about 98%. So we're talking about 98% sulfuric acid, 2% water. And that's at about um, equivalent to 10 moles of sulfuric acid per mole of water. So it's about 10 to 1 um, sulfuric acid to water. And at this concentration there's so little water available that the acid doesn't even ionize completely simply because there's not enough water available for that to happen. So when we talk about diluting acids or maybe diluting sulfuric acid we have to be aware of this heat of dilution. So, as you can see here, we've got the sulfuric acid and water, and it turns into the hydronium ion and the hydrogen sulfate ion, okay? And that reaction has an energy release of about 90 kilojoules per mole, and that's very high for a reaction like this. So that's why we have to be careful, because the heat of di dilution is, about, is a very exothermic process. So what happens if water is poured into the acid? Well, the energy released can actually boil the water and cause it to spit. So what that means is that, let's say we had a, a beaker of acid and then we decided to pour water into it. Now remember that this is about twice as dense as water. So the water comes in and things that are less dense will float on things that are more dense. So the water will just float on top because it's less dense than the, less dense than the sulfuric acid. But what the water, but at this interface of water and acid, there'll be ionization. And that ionization will release all this energy, and then that energy will go and boil the water. And because it's so rapid, the boiling of the water can actually cause the water to spit out of the beaker. And it can drag acid with it. So you've got this acid essentially flying out of this beaker. And obviously that's not a safe situation to be in. So that's why we never pour water into the acid, because it's, you can get dangerous situations like that happening. Instead, what we do is we slowly add the acid to the water to prevent the spitting. Okay? Now, let's say we've got that situation. So now red will still be water. Now if we pour a drop of acid into this water, it will hit the water. And yeah, maybe there will be a tiny bit of, of spitting, but it won't be fast enough. Um, there won't be enough heat released for that to become an issue. But when it hits the water, it will start to sink because it's more dense. And so that sinking will stop the, the spitting from happening because it'll sink to the bottom and dissipate that heat throughout the liquid. So you can't boil all that water straight away. So that's why we always add acid 
to the water and not the other way around. Okay? Now, concentrated sulfuric acid, what do we actually do with it? Well, sulfuric acid tends to reach higher concentrations um, than other acids, so nitric acid or hydrochloric acid, the other acids that you typically deal with, you won't see them in as high concentrations as sulfuric acid. Now, in other concentrated acids, when you have lots of, um, a lot of acid molecules, you will see that they're already ionized. All of the acid molecules will have broken up into H plus and their conjugate base. But sulfuric acid is a little bit different. Sulfuric acid, when it's concentrated, tends to absorb water and continue to ionize. So while um, all of these concentrated acids, the other types, are already ionized, concentrated sulfuric acid doesn't ionize when it's very concentrated. However, what it will do is it will absorb water from anywhere it can get and actually ionize itself. And that makes it very dangerous compared to other acids because not only does it dehydrate chemicals, it can also create um, acid out of seemingly nothing, okay? Um, in terms of oxidizing agents, well, an oxidizing agent, as you know, is a substance that causes oxidation. And a reducing agent obviously brings reduction, okay? Now, sulfuric acid, in terms of what we've just said here, is a very common oxidizing agent. It causes oxidation to happen very readily. So we use it to oxidize other substances. So as an oxidizing agent, we can see that Sulfuric acid can oxidize reactive metals, whether it's dilute or concentrated. Okay, so let's see here. You've got H plus from the sulfuric acid, obviously, plus magnesium oxidizes to give you the magnesium ion and hydrogen gas. Similarly here, you've got sulfuric acid and some H plus and the copper, uh, um, copper atom, and then it oxidizes to form water and the copper ion, so it oxidizes the copper. Okay, so you can see here as you go through, it's oxidizing each of these metals, or in this case, carbon. Okay. Now, it's also able to oxidize metals when it is hot and concentrated. So when it's hot um, and concentrated, it's capable of oxidizing metals as well. And in this state, it can also oxidize nonmetals. So when it's hot and concentrated, it can also oxidize nonmetals. So we've talked a lot about what sulfuric acid does with, to other chemicals, but in particular, water is the safe is the one that we want to deal with very carefully. So concentrated sulfuric acid is very strongly has a very strong affinity for water. Okay, so another chemical that you might have seen that has a strong affinity for water is sodium hydroxide or any of the group one hydroxides. So what happens is if you've seen sodium hydroxide, it will actually absorb water from the air and it'll become moist. So it's, a, it's quite an amazing substance. If you take anhydrous sodium hydroxide and put it out, it'll eventually sort of almost, you know, di uh, almost dissolve itself just in air, simply because it absorbs so much water. Similarly, sulfuric acid will do the same. It will just take in water from any source that it can get. Um, it can absorb water from gases, like the air, for instance, and even from hydrated salts. So you know when some salts have water ingrained in their structure, sulfuric acid can actually remove that water um, because it's just so strongly attracted to water. So this makes it an excellent drying agent as you've seen in esterification as well as um, ethanol production or ethene production from ethanol. But it also makes it extremely dangerous because it, like I said, it can just seemingly produce acid from nothing. So concentrated sulfuric acid can absorb water from any substance that contains hydrogen and oxygen. So even beyond what we've already mentioned, it just absorbs water from anything that has hydrogen and oxygen. So if it comes into contact with organic material, like sugar, it will remove oxygen and hydrogen um, from the substance and only leave the carbon. So here's a picture of a prac that you might have done. And what was in that container to start with was just glucose and you added sulfuric acid, and what happens is it removed all the water, and because that heat of dilution is very high, it boiled the water as well. And then all you're left with is carbon, right? Because all that's in glucose is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. 
So if you remove the H and the O, all you're left with is C, and that's that black substance there. And it's all foamy looking because it's the, the sudden boiling of the water by the sulfuric acid has made, it, has made little pockets of space, and that's why it has that foam structure. Um, but that's the level of affinity that, that sulfuric acid shows for water. It just can take it out of sugar and leave you only with carbon. Um, some other reactions that we deal with with sulfuric acid are neutralization reactions, obviously, because it's an acid. And like other acids, it can form precipitates as well. So if we mix it with barium, you can form barium sulfate. Okay. So that wraps up today's lesson on the properties of and reactions of sulfuric acid. So we've looked at the properties, such as its density, um, its appearance, and also its viscosity. And we've looked at some basic reactions involving um, sulfuric acid, such as reactions with metals, um, dilution reactions, and reactions with um, substances that contain water. Okay? So we'll move on to the question segment and see if there's anything that if we can pull all of this information together to answer these questions. So question six. When sulfuric acid is added to sodium chloride, um, the solid that is, sodium chloride solid, a colorless gas forms, which readily dissolves in water to give an acidic solution. So what is the substance formed in this reaction? So let's just start by putting down what we know. We've got NaCl and sulfuric acid. So it forms an acidic solution, um, an acidic gas. So maybe it's probably going to be HCl, because Na doesn't really do anything. Okay, so hydrogen chloride gas, which is HCl. If we just look at it, it's probably the only one that actually fits the category correctly. So write a balanced equation for this. Well, you've got sulfuric acid plus NaCl, and you get two Na, uh, Na2SO4 and HCl, as I mentioned before. Okay, so you just have to balance that equation. Question seven. Write a Rea reaction equation for silver interacting with hot concentrated sulfuric acid. Well, very complex reaction. So you've got the silver solid, the, the sulfuric acid liquid, and you've got H plus because it will be drawing water out of the air. And that mixes with, that causes the oxidation of the silver, which gives you the Ag ion, forms water because otherwise this wouldn't become aqueous. And then it finally forms SO2 as well, which is sulfur dioxide, as you're aware. So this part, last part will come from knowing these first two parts. And write a balanced equation for the reaction between glucose interacting with concentrated sulfuric acid. So we know that we've got C6H12O6, and eventually oh, H2SO4. And we know it ends up as carbon, right? So what else is left? And so if we know that sulfuric acid always draws water out of things, we know that it must also form water. Okay, So it forms water as well. Now all we have to do is balance it. As you can see here, we've got the glucose on the left. And you've got six carbons, because there's obviously six carbons here. And then you can form six water molecules out of the remaining 12 hydrogens and six oxygens. And then the H2SO4 is simply just a catalyst for this reaction. Okay. So question eight. When dilute sulfuric acid reacts with magnesium metal, the metal bubbles, showing that, that the reaction produces gas. What type of gas does this reaction produce? And how could the, identi the identity of the gas be confirmed? Okay, so year 10 chemistry, acid plus a metal gives you what? Well, it's hydrogen and a salt. Okay? So we know that the gas is hydrogen. So how do we test for hydrogen? We use the pop test. So we get a burning splint and put it underneath a test tube full of this gas, and it should pop. Um, and that's how we know it's hydrogen. So they produce hydrogen gas when they react with metals. So we use the pop test, as I mentioned. And so the gas is collected in a test tube and then exposed to a flame, which gives us that characteristic pop sound. 
Hydrogen gas in a test tube exposed to a flame will combust and make a distinctive popping sound, like I mentioned. So write an equation for magnesium metal interacting with dilute sulfuric acid. So you've just got the H+, plus because it's dilute, plus Mg gives you hydrogen gas, obviously, and magnesium ion. Okay. So question 9. Barium sulfide is soluble, but barium sulfate is not. Adding sulfuric acid to barium sulfide solution forms hydrogen sulfide and a precipitate. Write an equation for this reaction. Okay, so Let's do that. Barium sulfate, and we add it to sulfuric acid. And so we know that we get H2S out, which is hydrogen sulfide. And we also get some sort of precipitate. And we, it tells us that barium sulfate is not soluble, so that's probably our precipitate, right? And that balances our equation. Oops. And that's the equation that we have, OK? So in this case, they just split the, the sulfuric acid into the two H pluses and a sulfate ion. How could the precipitate be tested for barium ions? Well, a flame test could be used. We could use a flame test to tell what, uh, by the color. So when barium salts are exposed to an open flame, they create a distinctive pale green color. So copper produces that apple green, a sort of fluorescently green, whereas this is more of a paley type green. So we could use a flame test to tell if there's barium or not. And sulfuric acid can dehydrate formic acid to carbon monoxide. Write an equation for this reaction, and why is this reaction dangerous, um, too dangerous to form in a school lab? Okay, So simple equation. You just take out the water, H, 1H here, 1H here, and an O. That comes out. And then we get all that's left is CO. So that reaction is quite simple. So formic acid goes to water plus CO. Very, very easy. Now carbon monoxide in itself is toxic and a dangerous gas released by the reaction. So that's why we can't do it in a school, because carbon monoxide is quite deadly. Um, only low concentrations um, can cause asphyxiation, and that's not good for you. Okay. So that wraps up today's lesson on the, uh, the reactions and properties of sulfuric acid. So we looked at the basic properties of sulfuric acid. So what is it, what is it like physically? And we've looked at a lot of the reactions that sulfuric acid um, ha that happen to happen with sulfuric acid. So in the next lesson, we'll talk about sulfuric acid and safety, and how to handle it in a safe manner. So look forward to seeing you at our next lesson. Mm -hmm.